Okay, and now you now you should be able to click there. Got it. Exactly. And now you can start. Thank you very much, Dorian. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much for the introduction and also for the invitation. It's uh, my greatest pleasure to be here to give this seminar. Uh, in fact, um, this is the first in-person seminar that I think I'm giving since uh, quite a long while, uh, time, which, which makes this rather special. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is mostly about these two papers, one roughly a year ago, the other one came out I think, this spring, um, with Joseph Pena, Johan Blava, and Maria Agrania about uh, what we call the, the Tapo problem. So as you're probably aware of, um, string, string theory is an intrinsic Tenor and definite maximum theory, so we somehow have to compactify it in a six dimensional, seven dimensional space um, to get to, to four dimensional uh, physics. Otherwise, uh, we won't really be able to connect it with reality, I guess. Um, but this does not come without problems. Um, a, we have plenty of choices for um, these scalarly uh, for these spaces, and even if we um, consider only like the most simple supersymmetric case where, where the space is a uh, Calabial manifold. Uh, there's plenty of choices for, for these background choices. And moreover, these spaces typically have a very complicated topology. They have easily more than 100 or more non trivial cycles. And in principle, we have the freedom to um, put a certain electromagnetic background field, usually called fluxes, on each of these cycles. And um, we have therefore even greater number of choices for, uh, for these fluxes and these um, the fluxes will play a uh, main role uh, in my talk. And actually, um, this is not only a freedom, we also rather uh, should include this possibility because as I'm going to explain, um, these fluxes are necessary to, to give masses for all the um, scalar fields which I would have without them in my quantification, so I should really include them. So this very large combinatorical number um, of putting all these fluxes and all these different cycles of my compactification background gives rise to a very large number of possible string theory, but here the famous number one, one often is quoted as 10 to the 500, but one also reads different numbers, but in any case, it's an insanely huge number. And the number of all these like usually is uh, called the, the landscape or the string theory landscape and all the minima of, of um, um, very complicated potential and all these string theory back here um, are potentially um, viable, um, viable uh, string theory backgrounds. But this of course uh, gives rise um, to, to problems, for example, the often the question of predictability and the question of uh, which vacuum do we actually live in, which sometimes is thought in relation to the anthropic principle. Um, and these points are sometimes used as main criticism against, uh, against string theory. So um, it is therefore obviously very important to, to learn more about uh, this landscape and to explore this landscape. And I mean, one can imagine certainly many different ways how to do so. I mean, maybe the most naive approach is to like just try to systematically explore it by um, trying to enumerate all these vacua or to at least randomly scan over a certain uh, selection of these vacua. However, because that landscape is so huge, this approach usually, if not, if you're not in very special situations, usually this approach is, is doomed to fail. Um, just because of the, the large number of vacuo. A different approach is a statistical approach um, using um, trying to, um, using statistical methods, trying to estimate the number of vacuo and also the, the properties uh, and of, of vacuo in, in that landscape, which was very successfully uh, used roughly, roughly 20 years ago uh, by these people here. But also, I think another approach, which maybe is even the approach which is closest uh, to the heart of many of us, is to really tackle um, the question analytically, try to obtain precise mathematical 
um, statements about the existence of, of certain uh, vacua in the landscape or certain certain properties which vacua in the landscape must have or must not have. Um, for example, exploring symmetries of these vacua. A related uh, approach is uh, the Swampert program, where there's uh, quite a lot of uh, activity around uh, recently. However, another approach which I think only become accessible recently is uh, what I would call like to call an algorithmical approach using modern big data or machine learning algorithms, which maybe makes it uh, possible to to somehow get a handle to uh, onto uh, this large number of vacuum. Right and this is the approach I'd most like to focus on here. So uh, let me give a very uh, brief overview about what I'd like to talk about. So um, using machine learning or artificial intelligence approaches um, for string theory related questions has uh, attracted quite a bit of uh, activity recently. For example, um, there's a very nice video paper, um, which I recommend if you're interested. Um, and here I would like to focus on a um, very specific class of algorithms which are inspired by biological evolution or genetics um, and which try to use these principles to, to search or to generate string theory vacua um, with uh, specific properties. And here I'd like to use these approaches to study flux configurations which have, which have um, a lot of uh, moduli. I think these are the ones um, where, where traditional methods are most likely to fail and where we have uh, maybe a um, nice chance of, of learning something new using uh, these methods. So um, let me first start with a brief review of uh, flux compactifications in general. So the answer to one question about, yes, sure. about uh, page five. This, this one. Um, it must not be the um, the Afrosalam. Is it different Afrosalam or just? Uh, I'm actually not, I'm honestly not sure. I mean, it could be. I guess that just a title like, probably copied something similar. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I, I can check later on. But yeah, I think it's interesting. I think that's a title Afrosalam. Um, no, I'm sorry. I think I think that's a title actually, uh, but I will I will check afterwards. Let's see which one. Yeah. Okay. Let's start uh, with a with a review of flux compactification. So, as I said, the answers I, I want to take typically is uh, like a, a warped uh, a product of some four dimensional space time. So this is a Minkowski space time times a Calabrian manifold, and they uh, allow for for this background actually to be warped. The small w here, but I, I won't comment on this thing in, in, in this talk. And usually, this uh, gives them n equals to two supergravity or n equals to one uh, in, in four dimensions of L for this Calabria to be oriented folded. And such a background typically has a, a large number of uh, master scalar fields, which are moduli the, the geometric. Do uh, you do anything here? No, don't, okay. don't worry about it. Um, which are the, the geometric moduli or deformation parameters of this Calabria background. And they came in uh, two classes. They're the Keller moduli. Their number is given by this Hodge number H11. And they correspond, roughly speaking, to the volumes or sizes of the two or four cycles. But there's also complex structure moduli. And their number is given by the Hodge number H21. And they correspond in turn to the volumes of uh, the three cycles. Um, on, on that Calabria background. And now I'm, I'm talking mostly about uh, type 2B backgrounds. And in type 2B, I have a three form uh, field strength. And um, this gives me the freedom to uh, turn them on on these uh, three cycles. And this, in turn, will fix um, the sizes of these three cycles. If I have some fields which are more integer quantized on, on these three um, cycles, I, I get some rigidity and I'm not able to change the sizes of these three cycles anymore arbitrarily. And therefore, since the sizes of these three cycles correspond directly to uh, the complex structure moduli, I generate masters for these complex structure moduli and fix them uh, by this means. Um, one should maybe note that in type 2b, I don't have any two form field strings. 
So I will not be able to fix um, the Keller module by this procedure, at least not in time to be. Um, therefore, here I will only talk about complex structure modular stabilization, and I usually assume that I have much more complex structure modular than I have Keller modular. Um, but and I, I will not talk about possibilities how to stabilize the Keller modular. So how does that look specifically? So usually what one does one when uses a um, combination of this F3 and H3, the two um, three forms which are present in, in the theory, which transforms nicely under SL2. And then the kinetic term um, for, for these uh, um, fields uh, takes the following form. And importantly, I have this Hodge star operator, which uh, depends on, on the metric of the Calabria manifold. And therefore, if I give background values to um, this F3 and H3, I um, will generate a term which depends generically on on the background metric of that Calabria space, and uh, therefore this will give rise to a potential uh, for, for modular fields, field specifically for the complex structure modular fields. Um, specifically, um, one can quite nicely formulate this potential in terms of the superpotential, which is given by, by that formula here. I have to take the integral over the Calabria space. And I have to take this G3, this guy here, and batch this with omega. And omega is um, the harmonic three form, which I always have uh, on a Calabria uh, manifold. And therefore, and this harmonic three form depends on the complex structure modular, but not on the Keller modular. And therefore, um, and it does so actually um, holomorphically. And therefore, I get a superpotential, which uh, depends on. Um, on the complex structure moduli from that superpotential, I will then be able to, to obtain an actual potential for this moduli. So, um, for example, from that superpotential, I can look at the F term equations, and uh, just by equation counting, I see that I have exactly H21 equations for H21 moduli. So, in general, I would expect that this uh, um, generates enough equations to stabilize all of these H21 moduli. Uh, however, the caveat here is I really want to do that in practice and really want to study, uh, study this potential completely. Um, I need to know um, what are the integrals of uh, the derivatives of this omega, which are usually called period integrals, and these integrals are usually quite complicated, and uh, this makes uh, this whole story quite, quite complicated in practice, even though I might be in principle able to, to compute this one. Um, there's another caveat, um, which usually is called a tactful cancellation. Namely, um, this effectively boils down to the fact that we are on a compact background. And on a compact background, I'm not able to put arbitrary charges. Um, usually, flux lines have to start and have to end somewhere. Um, therefore, the net charge um, when I'm on a compact space always has to uh, add up to zero. So here I'm, I'm looking. Um, at the charge of a, a four-form gauge, gauge field, which therefore has a, a five-form field strength. And I see that actually these H3 and F3, if I both switch on, if I switch on both of them, they actually carry a charge with respect to that C4. And um, in fact, this is uh, the same charge as which is carried by a G3 brain. So what I can do now is I can I can take this Bianchi identity and I can integrate it over the compact space, and I will get an equation of the following form. I have one term which is the integral over the fluxes h three of h f three, and another term comes from all localized sources which also carry um, a charge, um, for example, brains or oriental port planes. And one should uh, probably notice that by the equations of motions, this integral here is. Um, is always positive um, because um, star H3 is, is proportional to F3. And if I insert this, I see that this is a manifestly positive quantity. So the only chance of satisfying this equality, of satisfying this charge conservation law, uh, uh, if you wish, is to have um, if to have is to have ingredients in the geometry and the compactification that carry a negative charge. And this charge is uh, generally given by this. Fashion. I can, for example, put G3 brains, they carry a positive charge, so they are probably not that interesting because I will, in the end, I want to have a large negative charge to make uh, 
space for, for, for this quantity here. But for example, I can also have O3 planes, you can have D7 brains, I can have O7 planes, and I can also have fluxes on the D7 brains. Um, and all these um, can contribute negatively. So I usually need quite a lot of these ingredients to be able to allow for, for these fluxes. Um, so let me quickly translate this story um, in the M theory or F theory setup. I actually I will not talk too much about F theory. You can you can also just think about this as a compactification of eleven dimensional M theory or supergravity on a Calabria fourfold. So instead of looking at three folds, we will now consider fourfolds. And here the complex structure moduli are labeled by H three one and correspond to the volumes of four cycles. And they're in general stabilized if it's switch on a non vanishing four form field space. So the corresponding flux. And this can again be described in, in this case now in terms of two superpotentials, because if I go from 11 on a um, complex four dimensional manifold, I go down to a, to a three uh, dimensional circle space for, for these two superpotentials. And in general, the story is just very analogous to uh, the type to be on a, on a three fold. And I again have a tangible cancellation condition, which consists of uh, the integral over the fluxes. And on the other hand, the negative contribution now can, can, comes from, um, can come from the topology of the fourfold, namely from the so-called Euler number of, of the fourfold background. And this, if I want to go in an F theory limit, this will encode all these uh, seven brain and uh, so on contributions, which I, which I showed to you earlier. So in a sense, this is a much uh, neater version of this type to be type of cancellation. Um, so this brings me to maybe the main point of the talk, namely what we call uh, the tadpole conjecture. So let me remind you just from before, the tadpole cancellation condition in an M or F theory takes the following form. And again, this integral over the fluxes is, uh, is strictly positive due to the equations of motions which enforce uh, G4 to be self-dual. So this is give, inserted in this, this gives a positive quantity. Therefore, I will only be uh, able to switch on the G4 if I have a Calabria fourfold as a positive Euler number. Um, and the Euler number can be nicely expressed in terms of the topology, topo topological data of the background in this case, in terms of um, the Hodge numbers uh, of the Calabriao manifold by this uh, relatively simple formula. And again, I would like to remind you that I'm studying uh, here kind of as a working assumption, I only consider the case where I have many more uh, complex structure moduli than Keller moduli. So I, I'd like to work in the regime where H31 is uh, generically larger than H11 and, uh, and H21. And in this regime, this quantity here on the right-hand side scales like one quarter of uh, the number of complex structure moduli. So we, we see that the right-hand side has a, has a very simple um, scaling behavior. Is it maybe possible to also analyze uh, the left-hand side, uh, the scaling behavior of the left-hand side of this equation? And for this to notice, important point is that this G4 is integer quantized. Um, so we cannot make this integral arbitrarily small because all the quantities here are integers. So the question is, um, does that give rise to some form of, of scaling behavior of, um, uh, of the left-hand side of that equation? So, and this is what we, um, what we call the, the tadpole conjecture. So assume we have F theory or M theory on the Calabria fourfold, and we, we make the following assumption that we have a large number of complex structure moduli and we assume that all of them are stabilized by some integer fluxes G4. And also we probably should assume that we are at a, a generic point, uh, a moduli space. So maybe this whole thing might fail if we go to very specific special points in moduli space. And then um, we conjecture that this integral here, G4 of H G4, kind of the flux contribution of um, uh, the charge contribution of these fluxes also scales linearly with, or scales at least linearly with the number of moduli where, where alpha is some, some order one constant. And um, if you remember on the right-hand side of the tadpole constellation condition, the proportionality constant was exactly one over four. 
So we see that again, alpha being one over four one quarter is a critical value. And if alpha is larger than one uh, over four, um, modular stabilization might generically uh, not be possible, assuming, of course, that this conjecture is true. Uh, any question uh, so far? Okay, there we go. Let me uh, go on. So just very briefly, we can, of course, go back to um, the type to be limit if we interpret this. So if we interpret this conjecture in, in F theory, it might be tempting to, to go back to uh, the type to be limit. And here, all these H31 complex structure moduli, they translate into the H21 complex structure moduli of the, of the threefold, threefold background, which I mentioned earlier. Also, they include the axodilatum of, uh, of the type to be theory. And in general, um, such backgrounds will also have a certain number of D7 brains. And these D7 brains also have their own moduli. So they also include um, the, the D7 brain moduli. And the flux charge translates accordingly into um, the integral G3, which G3, which uh, I mentioned earlier, and I can also have some, some fluxes on the D7 brains, but I think this won't be too important for the rest of the talk. And in particular, this localized or topological charge um, given by the Euler number divided by 24 will correspond to the contribution of the D7 brains to the type to be tuple cancellation condition. So now I can try to make uh, similar statements for, for type to be. I can assume that we are on the uh, Calabria threefold uh, background, and I want to stabilize all of the H21 complex structure moduli by fluxes. And I would again conjecture that the contribution of these fluxes to the tuple cancellation condition scales again linearly with the number of moduli. Or I can do a similar thing for the D7 brain moduli. I can assume that I have a certain large number of D7 brain moduli, and I want to stabilize them by word volume fluxes on these D7 brains. And I would again conjecture that this contribution scales uh, at least linear with the number of moduli. So to summarize, the, the statement is that whenever I want to stabilize a certain large number of, uh, of moduli with fluxes, um, the, the contribution of these fluxes scales at least linearly with uh, the number of, of moduli um, here for, for these two special cases. In um, so you could, of course, ask how can this possibly be true? I mean, I showed you these F-term conditions. Um, previously, I had exactly the right number of F-term conditions for the right number of moduli. However, we, we had a look in the literature and we found quite a few examples where, where people tried to um, explicitly um, stabilize moduli, like give explicitly which fluxes to put on which cycles of a concrete background. And surprisingly, almost all of um, these examples, um, they're compatible with that conjecture. And for all of these examples, actually, this, this number alpha was kind of in the same range around uh, 0.4. I, I do not want to go into the details here just to, to show that there's actually um, maybe something going on around this alpha being 0 0.4. Um, so of course, the question is, what is this alpha? And as I said, Samples from the literature indicate that it is maybe around 0 0.4, which is like a heuristical observation. And again, to remind you um, that the critical value is at uh, 1 over 4, and 0 0.4 is actually certainly larger than 1 over 4. Um, so now I'd like to describe some big data or artificial intelligence approach to systematically search for flux configurations which stabilize all moduli at the generic point in moduli space and which try to make um, this, this quantity, this tactical charge uh, as, as small as possible. And the approach I will use is something which is called uh, differential evolution. And by that, we try to uh, actually uh, test, test this conjecture. Um, all right. So, um, and we will actually do so for, for a very specific background, K3 times K3. Uh, I will say a bit uh, more about this uh, uh, in, a, in a minute. And K3 is actually that's a Calabrian twofold. So K3 times K3 will, will, will be uh, the, the fourfold background uh, I will study here. So, what is differential evolution? 
uh, differential evolution it's a global optimization algorithm which is inspired by biological evolution or genetics and the goal is to find the global minimum of the fitness function so i have some function um, which maps um, some some vector space into the real numbers and i want to find um, for a given such function i will want to find the, the minimum ideally the global minimum of that function and the nice thing about that algorithm is that I do not need to know anything about the gradient uh, of that function. So the idea is to, to start with some, some population of, of n sample solutions. So I randomly select uh, n of, of such vectors. And then by, by some prescription, I, I take two or more of, of these elements of this population and somehow combine them or mutation or mutate them again according to, to a certain um, prescription. And what that does essentially is to, um, to randomly change either some elements of these vectors or to, uh, to merge two, uh, two of these vectors uh, randomly. And after doing that, I will get a new population and I will only select those uh, which I will call the, the fittest elements. So I will only select those which have um, which are the which have a minimal f so which are the fittest with respect to that fitness function and this will then give my new population and then i iteratively uh, repeat this process over and over until i hopefully converge to to a many so the fittest means smallest the fittest smallest. in this case means smallest f of course i can just uh, put a sign here yeah. Yeah, but usually the uh, convention is that when one looks for when he constructs a strictly positive function and uh, searches for for the minimum of that function, yeah, and then fit is indeed means the, the smallest I have yes. um, And this actually has a, a good chance of actually exploring um, the search space um, quite nicely and also um, converging to, uh, to global minimum. Therefore, this uh, seems to be quite well suited for, uh, for these questions. Um, so the challenge, of course, is um, so there's a lot of literature on that in, in, in computer science. But the challenge here is, of course, how to uh, design such a fitness function, which is uh, suitable for, for this problem. And I told you earlier that, in principle, um, we need to know the what are these, uh, these superpotentials? And these superpotentials, they depend on very complicated functions, uh, certain, certain period maps, which are a solution of complicated differential equations. So this is still a, a rather difficult problem. So to make that a bit easier, we will look at a very special background, namely K3 times K3, as I uh, advertised earlier. And this is actually a very well-known uh, playground for flux compactifications because it has a lot of special properties uh, which make uh, life uh, a lot easier. And in particular, in this paper here, it was highlighted that uh, we can easily actually stabilize all moduli of that background, which includes scalar and complex structure moduli, uh, due to the special hyperscalar structure of the K3 manifold. And in particular, we don't need to know anything about these period maps. So we do not need to know this uh, functions W and W hat explicitly. We, we just need to do some, some integer arithmetic, some relatively simple linear algebra um, to solve that problem. And that makes uh, this background very, very well suited for, for computer aided searches. Um, so as I said, um, uh, sorry. So um, we, we can go one step further and um, go, go a little bit away uh, for a moment from this K3 times K3 case. And we can try to uh, solve actually a related rather general mathematical problem, a, a lattice problem. And I will, I will try to explain in a minute how this is related to K3 times K3. Um, so what we want to, to start with, kind of our input data, is an even lattice, an integer lattice, um, with uh, a certain inner product on, on that lattice. And then our search space are matrices um, on the tensor product of, of the lattice, which itself. So I don't know if you can write them 
I can, um, if I have a basis of that, uh, uh, of, um, if I have a basis of the lattice, I, I can write that uh, inner product as Dij, uh, and then um, these matrices I can, I can write as so Dij. So um, everything is given in terms of integer, uh, integer matrices. I have this Dij, which is the inner product on the on, on this method, which is just some, some integer, integer uh, matrix. And then the third space is, is these uh, integer uh, matrix Dij. And now I want uh, these integer matrices to uh, satisfy the following three properties. Uh, namely, I can, I can first, I, I want to look at these combinations of these contractions of, of G and D, which given that index structure is certainly possible to do so, these contract um, combinations will again be integer matrices. And I want that these integer matrices are diagonalizable and that all of their eigenvalues are non negative. So that's a relatively, um, at least in principle, relatively simple uh, linear algebra constraint. I also want that this D, if I um, restrict it to an eigenspace, I want to have this um, to have a definite signature when restricted to an eigenspace. And moreover, maybe a bit more technical um, requirement is that um, there's no root um, of that latter. So root is a, is a, is a vector of length uh, two or minus two here in that, in that lattice. I want none of such vector to be orthogonal to all positive norm eigenvectors. So here, I, I try to depict that, uh, that lattice. These are the, the black dots are the, the points in the lattice. And now I have um, these matrices and I, I do a um, compute their eigen, eigenvectors. And some of these eigenvectors will have a positive norm. Some will have a negative norm because this lattice uh, has an indefinite signature. And I only look at those which have a positive norm and they span some form of uh, plane or hyperplane in that lattice. And I want that no uh, roots or no uh, lattice point with norm two um, is, is orthogonal um, to, to that plane spanned by the positive norm eigenvalues. So in a sense, this, this plane is not allowed to, to align too, too nicely with the, with the lattice. And finally, I would like to minimize this quantity, um, which is just given by, by the trace of, um, of that matrix. So these are all relatively um, um, simple integer linear algebra questions, which I can, can attack um, on a computer. So this is what I want to uh, design this, uh, this fitness function around. So how does it, um, how does it actually relate to K3 times K3? So K3 times K3 has a very well-known uh, middle cohomology, namely the middle cohomology is, is given um, by um, the following lattice. This is a 22 dimensional lattice of, of signature three comma 19. So I have uh, three uh, positive uh, norm directions and 19 negative norm directions. And a, a point in a modular space of K3 corresponds to the choice of three self-dual forms in the um, middle cohomology. And I can take two of them and uh, assign them to be the omega, the uh, holomorph to two form, and one of them, the third one, will be proportional uh, to the Keller form of the, of the background. But I can interpret these, which somehow connects this a bit more uh, better to familiar notion of uh, Calabrian manifolds. Um, so, but I can interpret the three of these forms as some form of plane in uh, the the tensor product of the lattice with the real numbers. Um, so somehow this, this plane, this, this red plane or hyperplane in that lattice corresponds to a point in the modular space uh, of, of K3. And moreover, it is known that if this plane somehow aligns with the lattice in a special way, such that the root of the lattice is orthogonal to that plane, then actually this K3 background will uh, develop a singularity, um, uh, orbifold singularity, and won't be smooth anymore. So uh, 
I actually want to avoid that. I only want to study backgrounds where K3 stays smooth. And this is where, where this condition uh, stands for. So to summarize, was actually described in, in this paper here. So if I study a modulus double regulation on K3 times K3, where I have um, four form fluxes, which have two legs on each of these K3s, this is why I, I have this, this structure here with the, the, these two indices, one index for one of the K3s. Then I can translate these conditions, which I, which I gave earlier, into uh, conditions on non modular stabilization of the background. Um, namely, if these two matrices are diagonalizable with non negative eigenvalues, you can show that this relates to a uh, Minkowski vacuum of uh, the respective potential. Moreover, if this D has a definite signature on all of these eigenspaces, then this plane I defined earlier um, is, is uniquely defined. And this actually means I cannot wiggle it around. So all moduli are stabilized. And third, uh, as I said in the previous slide, um, this uh, root condition means um, that the K3 is smooth. And finally, um, this uh, Tadpole charge this combination of the fluxes which enters um, the Tadpole cancellation condition is exactly given by this trace of this, uh, of, um, this matrix. So um, with this knowledge, it is now possible to design such a fitness function. So uh, I will consider populations which can consist of flux matrices because I, I want to, to find the ideal flux configuration as you wish. And for technical reasons, I actually start with, uh, with real value matrices because this um, differential evolution algorithm due to this combination and mutation operations actually works better on real numbers than on, on integer numbers. I, I start with a real um, value matrix and then I round it to the integers. And then whenever one of these three conditions which I introduced earlier is violated, I assign a, a penalty, which is a, I assign a penalty, which is a certain positive number um, to, to these matrices N. And finally, I compute that Q, which is just the, the trace. How do you assign such a number? What's the rule? Um, that's heuristically. I mean, I, whenever one of these conditions is, uh, is violated, I, I generally assign a, a positive penalty. Um, and then I somehow have to heuristically decide which of these conditions are more and which are less important and, um, and assign these, these penalties uh, by hand. I mean, it might be possible to, to take a bit more systematic approach, but this worked actually quite well for us. Um, I mean, one can, one can certainly start with uh, assigning the same penalty to all of them, but giving a relatively large penalty whenever. Uh, is not satisfied. Um, ideally, one would actually not just give a, um, a constant penalty, but somehow tries to, to quantify how, how far away from the matrix being diagonalizable we are, for example. For example, uh, or one of the conditions was to, uh, that all eigenvalues have to be positive. So, uh, for example, uh, the penalty could be. Uh, the sum of all uh, negative eigenvalues, for example. So it successively becomes smaller the, the closer we are getting to not violating this condition. This is actually, this actually works quite well to have some, not just some, something constant, but that we are actually um, able to, to progressively to smoothly approach uh, the, uh, the configurations we are interested in. Um, so, and then we design this fitness function by, by summing up these penalties, we usually assign some weights to them. And also finally, this, this Q, which we actually want to minimize. Um, so, so we use this fitness function and we actually use some, uh, some pre-existing uh, implementation of this differential evolution algorithm, which is in, in these packages, which are written by the just like to switch, you know much more about these algorithms. But still, the problem appears to be rather challenging, in particular if these lattices are large. Um, the, the search spaces are enormously large. I mean, you can easily estimate, assuming you have some, told you the, 
K3 lattices is 22-dimensional. So if you have 22-dimensional matrices and you, for example, in the easiest case, you, you only allow them to be populated by entries 0, plus 1, or minus 1, this gives a very large number of configurations. Um, so this makes the whole thing rather challenging. And moreover, um, this, um, this problem, I highlighted that we do not want to have any roots orthogonal to the eigenvectors um, is a, a problem which in the computer science literature is known to be NP-hard. So this means there's no known algorithm which solves this problem in polynomial time. So the time to solve this question uh, scales uh, more than the polynomial typically exponentially is the, in this case, the dimension of the statuses, which is, uh, which is not very bad. Good. So still using these fancy computer technology, um, still the convergence is rather slow and we are approaching the minima um, relatively slowly. We try to overcome some of the difficulties by adding uh, another like more good for slope research algorithm, but I think I, I will not talk about this now. And um, the main reason why we looked at this more general lattice problem, why we formulated this problem, not only specifically for K3, but for, for general lattices is that um, for smaller lattices, um, this algorithm naturally converges much faster. So we can actually gain quite a lot of uh, intuition um, by, by looking at smaller lattices. So uh, let me give an example here. Um, so this U, some, some hyperbolic lattice in the two dimensions, um, which uh, in a product of this form. So by, by taking three copies of that and uh, um, summing them together, we get a, a fairly easy six dimensional lattice. And we can play um, this game um, for this lattice. And what I'm plotting here on, on the x-axis is actually this Q, the, the trace of this matrix, which I highlighted, which corresponds to the contribution to the tactical cancellation condition. And um, on, on the y-axis, I have how many of, uh, of these matrices I, uh, I found uh, in, my, uh, in my population. And so we start after 60 seconds, um, one finds a relatively nice uh, uh, smooth distribution of these uh, charges Q. And then I uh, let this algorithm do its thing and it slowly pushes um, the charges to, to smaller uh, values, which is exactly what we, what we asked it uh, to do. So this is for example, after two minutes, this is after five minutes and after, in this case, uh, half an hour um, of, of uh, running this algorithm, we see that uh, all uh, matrices are five, uh, all charges, or all, all matrices have charges five or six. Uh, and in particular, um, we do not find anything smaller at all, which uh, we see as a very clear indication that given these constraints, these three conditions, it is not possible to push, uh, to push this charge to something uh, more than five. So this we see as a very clear indication that given this uh, lattice problem, for a given lattice, there typically is a uh, smallest uh, charge um, under, under the given constraints. Um, so one can, one can play the same game um, for, for larger lattice, in this case, EA times EA plus times U. And here the situation is unfortunately not that, that clear anymore. Um, Again, I can, I can start, uh, in this case, after actually 20 minutes, if you should cause, compare here, this was after 30 minutes, so this is now after, after 20 minutes. Um, I again find a relatively uh, smooth distribution, which with time will be pushed um, to, to smaller and smaller values of, uh, of the charge. Um, but now after, in this case, I think after 36 hours, we're in a situation where this certainly was pushed to, to smaller values, but it's not clear. So the minimum we found here was 21, but it's not, not so clear anymore to, to see whether there's something with 20 or not. Yeah, that's is, is it the image or are there bins missing on this uh, after this again? On that one? Yeah, I, I think I think that's the image. I mean, oh. there, there could be some structure here. There's like some 
some gaps, right? Which which we did not explore actually, but but these lines, I think that's that's just there. Right? Um, so we again see that we probably won't be able to put that to a arbitrary small, arbitrary small, small values. Um, so um, there again seems to be probably some, some minimal charge for this given lattice, um, but it is not clear what is uh, what is the, the minimal charge here. Is it 21 or maybe is there something with 20 which we just, just uh, did not see because we did not uh, look at it. <coughs> And for that reason, what we did actually, whenever we ended up in a, in a situation like that, we, we kind of took all these matrices with like the, the smallest charge and somehow tried to do some, some random brute force uh, search in, in the vicinity of them by like uh, switching on and off uh, arbitrary elements of these matrices and somehow see if, if in the vicinity of the, the minimum, which this algorithm found, if there's anything new. So in a sense, this minimum, uh, this algorithm turned out to be rather well, we believe in like locating the, the positions or the vicinities of the global minima, but actually finding around the global minimum, the, the actual minimum um, seems to be much more successful by, by using some, some local brute force uh, algorithm around these points. So um, we did this um, for actually for, for quite a few lattices. Um, and we, we find that there's always a, a minimal charge, which um, at least roughly depends on the, on the dimension of these lattices. So this is, these are the lattices in, in question. These are usually uh, some, some root lattices of some, uh, some semi-simple Lie algebras, uh, tensor with uh, some, some copies of this U um, lattice to somehow um, mimic um, the structure of this K3 lattice. In green are the, the two uh, ones which, uh, which I highlighted to you earlier. Um, and this one, the last one, is actually the, the K3 lattice. And interestingly, one, one sees that um, this minimal charge kind of is always roughly proportional to, to the dimension of the, of the lattice. So there, there seems to be some structure. Um, okay, as I said, there seems to be some universal behavior that this Q min somehow seems to scale in some form with the dimension of the lattice, even though um, it's uh, first we actually, when we started doing that, we, we thought it would be exactly the, the dimension of the lattice, um, but this uh, turned out to be false. It's not, it's not exactly the dimension of the lattice, it somehow it just seems to be close by. Um, so we, we see the scaling behavior. And um, as, I, as I mentioned, um, determining the actual value of the minima, in particular for large lattices, is a much more difficult problem um, for, for the reasons I mentioned. Um, so the problem is given that we have some putative cumin, what is kind of the probability that the absence of something small is just a purely statistical effect? And this would uh, require some, some more quantitative. Uh, Knowledge about the distribution of these cues and also the, the quantitative performance of um, this uh, search algorithm, which we, we unfortunately uh, don't really have. Um, so let me uh, again highlight this point. So I think this is the, the lattices which I showed to you earlier. And again, uh, what, is, what is the probability to, to find something with, with a few uh, smaller than 21 in that case? So here we, we see some relatively smooth distribution, but here extrapolating this to some smooth distribution from which we could draw some statistical statements. So it seems to be much more challenging. Um, so finally, um, we did this whole game um, to, to learn something about this very background we are interested in, namely um, K3 times uh, K3 which has this uh, very special 22 dimensional lattice. And here, we actually, we spend obviously most time on that case. Here's the one, one example result for, for one of our searches. And we managed uh, to find um, 
more than 100,000 matrices, flux matrices, where um, this tadpole charge by the fluxes takes the value of 25. But we did not find a single one where it is 24 or lower. So we see this as a um, very strong indication that actually 25 is the best we can do, and 24 is not possible. Modular, of course, the, the caveats which I tried to, to highlight earlier. And uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned. So this Q flux has to be canceled in the tadpole cancellation condition by, by the Euler number of the background. And since the Euler number of um, one K3 is 24, the Euler number of uh, K3 times K3 divided by 24 is actually 24 itself. Um, so it seems like we are we're never able, given the constraints that we do want to have a, a smooth non-singular background to satisfy um, this type of cancellation condition in, in that case. Uh, so modular stabilization at the generic smooth point of modular space, at least on that background, uh, does not seem to be possible. <clears throat> And um, uh, in particular, we could now try to, uh, to compute or estimate uh, this proportionality uh, constant uh, in the tadpole conjecture by, by dividing that by the number of moduli. And this actually gives the relatively nice value of 0 0.44. And I think I showed you earlier that the, the, the examples we found from the literature uh, also indicated that this alpha is something um, around uh, the ballpark of, of uh, 0 0.4. Um, so maybe there's uh, something something else there. Um, okay, so um, let me um, let me conclude on that. Um, so if we if we look at M theory on, on K3 times K3, and we want to stabilize all of the moduli at a generic point in moduli space. Um, meaning there's no overboard singularities, and this flux is arbitrarily small at two charge due to type for cancellation. This Q should be smaller or equal than 24. We, we find that we cannot have all three of them. So somehow the, the general lesson seems to be that fluxes with a, with a small charge always come with uh, additional light degrees of freedom. So the only because the only way how to how we can get such a small charge is either by not having stabilized all moduli, or we could have a, a, a orbital singularity, uh, which usually a, a gauge group um, would be located, which would introduce additional uh, light mass lifts, uh, degrees of freedom. So whenever we try to push this uh, charge uh, to something small, uh, there they seem to be additional light degrees of freedom. So I prepared a, a few slides about the Zitterbach, but I think due to time, I think I will, I will skip them. And this story is also um, rather popular. Um, um, I can, if you have a question, I can say something about that. Um, so let me let me maybe summarize. So this type of conjecture, which we uh, tried to put forward, says that whenever I, I want to stabilize a certain number n moduli um, by, by fluxes, these fluxes um, carry a charge which uh, scales uh, linearly with, uh, or at least linearly with uh, the number of moduli. And due to tuple cancellation constraints, um, this um, might provide a challenge for, for flux, control, uh, flux stabilization, particularly F theory vacua um, with uh, many moduli. But um, there's, of course, uh, many more questions. One question is, is maybe. Uh, if you allow for singularities, um, and we actually do want singularities because these singularities usually come with some gauge groups. And for phenol reasons, we usually want to have at least some, some form of gauge groups. Can we, can we lower the charge and, and how much? And of course, in a sense, this whole computer approach is a, is a bit uh, heuristic. Can we actually give some, some analytic hard uh, mathematical arguments why this is the case, or maybe why this is not the case, and this is just some, some artifact of um, this computer analysis. OK, thank you very much. Yes, thank you for this very nice talk. So uh, do, we, do we have any questions from people here in the audience? 
maybe uh, can you talk a little bit about the basic situation? Um, uh, okay, just uh, let me just summarize very briefly. Um, so one one version to um, to stabilize, uh, to, sorry, to to obtain the zeta vector in, in string theory, in particular in the context of Pat uh, is what is called the KKLT scenario, and that usually involves some some geometry with uh, what is called a, a warp uh, throat, some geometry which uh, very uh, strongly varying warp factor. So uh, a geometry which has some region where we have a very large to uh, uh, gravitational redshift. And then the idea is to put some, some ingredients, some anchor brain um, with a positive tension in the region with a very large redshift. And this anchor brain, due to having a, a positive uh, energy density, positive tension, will lift the overall energy density of the system to something positive. But due to this redshift, this lift is somehow exponentially suppressed and we just lift to something with a very small cosmological constant, which is kind of what we, what we want to obtain. However, we found by, by studying the stabilization of, uh, of that modulus explicitly, um, that having such uh, a large redshift um, requires uh, this throat also to, to carry a, a relatively large charge, a charge which also contributes to this Tatum cancellation condition. So if you already see some tension in the Tatum cancellation condition by the number of negative ingredients coming from either from, from brains or from this topological Euler number in the F theory case, and also some tension from um, the contribution from the fluxes somehow become large for many moduli. We might not be able to accommodate uh, the, the large charge which we need to, uh, to generate such a strongly involved uh, region in, in, in the compactification space. Um, so for that reason, uh, that could also put some, some tension on, on this type. So can one reduce one of like this 10 to 500 landscape of string theory by, by this uh, technology? Um, so I would, um, this is of course, yeah, the question I'm, I'm wondering about, I mean, assuming I, I don't have a special background, K3, K3, like a generic fourfold or threefold, to which extent can I, can I use this technology and then scan it for? And I, I would hope that it's possible, but it's, uh, it's certainly uh, very difficult. And I, I don't really know how to, how to do so concretely. There are some approaches by, by going to special points, large complex structure points, modular space, and so on. Um, however, of course, I mean, if one would assume this uh, conjecture to be true, um, one would assume that generically it is, uh, it is not possible to, to stabilize all moduli of a uh, Calabi-R manifold with a large number of moduli. So that would potentially indicate that uh, a lot of points in that large landscape are phenomenologically not interesting because not having uh, stabilized uh, or having problems uh, Is it possible to map uh, you know, the, the uh, compactifications that you're saying are not interesting to what people have studied in the swampland? And people say that these are they belong to the swampland. Um, I I'm I'm not sure if there's um, so many of these swampland conjectures somehow say, okay, if a, if a effective field theory has this and that property, we will not be able to, to realize it in the, in, um, in the string theory landscape. Um, here, I, I'm not sure if one can directly relate um, this statement to, to a swampland statement of, of this kind. Often these swampland statements are motivated, for example, of some, from some black hole physics. Um, there's a statement, uh, the conjecture that uh, 
kind of all uh, all black holes are required to be able to decay. Therefore, one assumes that every quantum gravity theory has a state in a, in a spectrum with above the externality bound. I don't know if one can can link that that conjecture to a statement of that form. What one could, of course, try to do is to to use some some technology of that form, some some computer technology, to somehow actively try to to disprove. Uh, some of them conjectures. Uh, right? If they are true, one would of course not succeed. But one could take one of these conjectures and try to like actively search for points in the landscape which would violate one of these uh, conjectures, um, which which might be interesting to do. But I'm, I'm not sure if someone has, has tried to do that. But, but the, I mean, your construction, I not always starting from uh, sort of. String theory setting. And, uh, yes, I mean, yeah. The, so the the points I find, which are which are good, I know that they are belong to the landscape. Therefore, uh, they should better I, agree I, with this. I guess my question is: Will it be possible to generate uh, compactification which would belong to compact um, in, in this process? Well, I, I mean, by definition, I think if I if I would generate a compactification by this process. Then, by definition, I think it does not belong to the swampland because all all points in the all theories in the swampland do not come from from string theory. So, if I would find something, then you would say that this would if I would find something in the landscape which violates one of the swampland conjectures, this would in that sense uh, disprove the swamp conjecture. Um, but. Uh, so far, we haven't, that might be also a good term. But I mean, what I, I mean, as a final remark, what I should say, I mean, all these compactifications, <coughs> sorry, all these compactifications on K3 times K3 are actually not, which we, which we generated, are actually not in the landscape because they violate this tuple bound. So the, the tuple bound in this case was exactly at 24, and everything we found was at 25. So we were never actually able to satisfy. Uh, the type of bounds so all these uh, these points are actually uh, not in the landscape. Okay. Yeah, great. So, so just let me give uh, the opportunity to our virtual participants. So, is there anybody who, who wants to ask a question? I hope they can they can hear us well. Okay. Just just one second for that. Nobody. Everybody is happy. Okay, so then uh, let's thank uh, Severin again for the very nice Let me just stop the recording.